The evolutionary biology process is a process of what's called symbiosis, where two or more living things efficiently share an energy landscape and exchange energy in a way um, that propagates uh, both species and creates more complexity in that little biome. So that means that if any creature in a biosphere or in any predator-prey system were to become significantly stronger, faster, smarter than its opponents, competitors in that predator-prey system, it will snuff itself out by dominating and thereby choking off its supply of symbiosis and food in the, in the system. And this happens all the time. This is a, a, a standard understanding for evolutionary biologists. Humans aren't even close. Like you can take the brain to body mass ratios of the next smartest animals on this planet and it's not even close. It's freakishly beyond any other animal and the uniqueness of our size of prefrontal cortex and, and what we're doing, right? We have the ability to create atomic bombs and destroy the biosphere. So the point is, is that might have been one of the oversights of the people who set up the SETI program and who, uh, who, who, came, who focused on the Fermi paradox mm. is that it's a little bit of a sloppy or aggressive assumption that well, wherever there's life, there must be, it must culminate in humans. No, sharks are much more evolved for their environment than humans. We're still in the middle of evolving out tonsils and in our pinky toe, right? <laughs> we're, we're not fully baked yet, whereas you can go to certain other animals like sharks and you could see millions of years where that species of shark doesn't change wow. in, its, in its niche because it's been practically perfected. Abstract hyper-consciousness is just, it's what we like, and it's what does our technology and what allows yeah. this podcast, but it's not necessarily what a biosphere, right, is aiming for. That's one of the big um, things that could be used as a straight-faced argument that we may not be the first life in the universe, but we might be the first uh, hyper-intelligent, mm. technologically endowed life. I'm leaning that way because of the SETI, the lack of the, the, the quiet as a pin drop evidence. And by the way, we're just getting started as a universe. The average solar lifetime is about uh, 10 billion years old, which makes our universe about 1.4 solar lifetimes old. And most of the models for cosmology allow countless solar lifetimes before the end of the model, the big fizzle or a big crunch or whatever the cosmological model is, they allow all of them far more than just one and 1.4 solar lifetimes. So we're early and some of that 1.4 solar lifetimes, no life could exist anywhere because some of it was just too hot everywhere in the universe. Maybe we're the first. So if there's not that many high intelligent life forms out there, do you think these UFOs were man-made or do you think they could be coming from some other source? Oh, good question. Yeah, I mean, it is a good question. I know you tried to um, connect it before I rambled on there just now <laughs> to the self-simulation hypothesis, which that's which, a yeah. paper that's, that's getting a lot of reads and that we published. David, you're a co-author. Marcelo is a co-author. I think we should cover the basics for okay. the self-simulation hypothesis just for our audience. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we can relate it, like you said, yeah. David, to this um, this Fermi paradox question, and and this question of, hey, hypothetically, let's say, you know, that these people in these congressional hearings lately are telling the truth, and that all these uh, people all around the world increasingly seeing these phenomena, some of them that can't be explained. Many of them can be explained, right? But it's starting to get to a point where you start you're surveying people. And do you believe in extraterrestrial life? The majority of scientists believe it's out there. And then a smaller number of scientists believe that extraterrestrial life has made contact with us, but that number is growing. And so the basics of the self-simulation hypothesis. First, we follow the implications of quantum mechanics pretty religiously. And quantum mechanics implies for us and many mathematical physicists and quantum field theorists that Fundamentally, reality is made of information. Okay. And if reality were made of information, then one would have to agree 
on what information is. So I suggest that information is meaning conveyed by symbolism. For example, zeros and ones, right, are, are symbols. And if you order them in a certain way, according to a language, you can have, you know, bits turn into bytes, which can turn into higher level uh, structures in a, in, a, in a digital code or a bird language, right, or a, or a spoken language. Any form of meaning that you find in science or elsewhere, it's gonna be communicated in a language or code theoretic manner. Okay. So I tend to like this definition of information as meaning conveyed by symbolism. What is a symbol? A symbol is anything that can be thought of, right? Mm. Uh, in math and set theory and object, is anything that can be thought of, and any object can be a symbol. And meaning, well, that gets weird, right? Because meaning is a substance that entities capable of ascribing or recognizing or creating meaning traffic in. So we mm. as humans, we deal in meaning. This whole conversation is about meaning, right? right? We walk around the world and, oh, that's a pretty sunset and that, I need, I need some food, right? Everything is meaning and we are conscious. So we don't know if a grain of salt is running around ascribing meaning to things. If information is meaning conveyed by symbolism and if meaning requires an entity capable of ascribing meaning, recognizing, attributing meaning, then it might be tricky to try to um, surgically separate the term information from the term consciousness. And here's where the problem is. Scientists don't agree or really know what consciousness is. At Quantum Gravity Research, we focus on the nexus of consciousness and mathematical physics, and we admit that we don't know exactly what consciousness is. We just know a few things that it seems to do. It's really spooky and mystical. It gets very philosophical, like what is this stuff consciousness, right. right? And what if it were foundational to the very definition and foundation of reality? The whole team at Quantum Gravity Research needs your help. We're asking for $1 a month. Please click the link in the description below to join our giving circle.